and we're live. Hi, everyone. So welcome to this new Tuesday lunch uh, with Rita. And uh, sorry for the slight delay. Um, I am Alex Lambero. I'm a pediatric rheumatologist uh, in, uh, in Lyon. We are delighted to welcome you, but we have an issue, as you may see in the, the video, there is one missing guy who, who is Marco <laughs> Gattorno, who will normally join us very, very soon, but he's in trouble with uh, some technical issues. So um, I can give a few words of, uh, uh, and we will wait for him. I, I think it's just an issue of, uh, of a few, few minutes, one or two minutes. So more than 200, person where I uh, were uh, inscribed and we have already 71 people uh, connected so thank you very much for joining I think it's always a uh, fascinating speakers and uh, a good way to learn more about uh, auto-inflammatory disease these days so as you know in the RITA we have several stream immunodeficiency vasculitis primary primary immunodeficiencies auto-inflammation pediatric rheumatology and uh, all this stuff. So it's a way to learn more about all this immune mediated disease. So um, all these Tuesday lunch are very, very well attended and, and very uh, instructive. So waiting for Marco, I may ask my uh, co-chair, Francesca Minoya to present herself. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today to be part of the uh, Enrita lunch session together with my co chair, Alexandre. Uh, I'm Francesca Minoy. I am a pediatric rheumatologist uh, in uh, um, the pediatric rheumatology unit uh, uh, of Milan, Italy. Uh, and um, uh, I have a particle uh, 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 and a, uh, uh, interest in uh, uh, hyperinflammation and uh, hyperinflammatory disease, like, uh, for example, microphage activation syndrome. And I'm part of the uh, MIS Systemic GIA uh, working group of the pediatric European rheumatologist. And I'm really looking forward to the two incredible speakers of today uh, to discuss uh, with us the uh, practice practical approaches of uh, a very complex uh, uh, clinical part of the auto-inflammatory disease. Um, and, no, that's very good. And to do so, actually, we have two speakers normally yeah. on stage. We have already one, which is uh, already good. And she's a fantastic woman. So Sophie Georgian Lavial, she's a, a professor of internal medicine. She is uh, involved in auto-inflammatory disease for a while. She is also the head of the National Reference uh, uh, Center located in Tenon Hospital, dedicated to adult practice. But she, uh, she always mentioned that she's very keen to go to any pediatric uh, meeting because she learned a lot about genetic disease and she's an expert of Mendelian disease occurring in in adults and all these auto-inflammatory stuff. So it's fantastic to have you here with us, uh, Sophie, today, especially because you're not aware, but maybe you'll have to give a double talk instead of one, which is <laughs> really challenging. But uh, no, I'm kidding. Don't worry. In any case, we will listen to you and we will discuss together at the end. So I I don't know if we, what's the time now? It's uh, 10 past 12. So. I don't know if uh, we should go ahead now or what's your feeling, Sophie? We we may start with you and and then wait for, for Marco's uh, presentation at the end. And if he's not capable to join, we will have some, uh, some time for discussion. So as you see, for all the attendees, there is this uh, chat box and the question tab. So you can uh, introduce the question during the talk. And um, in some way, we may have some additional discussion time and uh, uh, let's see what happens. So what, what do you want, Sophie? That's uh, OK to start. Um, yes. Can you see my screen? Do you want to wait uh, one minute? Can you see my I screen? I think so. Yes, but yep. we only see connected. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Yeah. Coming. So you Perfect. see the first slide? Yeah. So. Thank you for the, the uh, 
So thank you for the introduction and uh, invitation. So um, this will be a duet uh, with a, a pediatrician and me. And uh, the title was Practical Approach for the Management of Undifferentiated Systemic Auto-Inflammatory Disease. So it's quite a long uh, term. So I hope you can see well my screen. Uh, I'm trying to hide the, the tool of the webinar, sorry. Um, okay, so can you see my second slide? Just yes. to be sure. Okay, yep. so uh, we will follow the same uh, plan, Marco and I, so uh, he will speak after me. Uh, I will firstly um, explain what is the uh, definition nowadays of uh, undifferentiated systemic anti-inflammatory disease. Maybe I will say undifferentiated SAED after uh, to be a little bit shorter. Then I will speak about how to explore them uh, uh, in practice and how to classify them. And I will finish by the treatment. Uh, so everything I will say will be the adult part and Marco will uh, speak about the uh, pediatric part. Maybe um, Alex uh, knows how many pediatricians are connected and how many adults. Maybe you know this and maybe you will be able to tell me. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> you're, not you're not aware. So this is the adult part. So the definition, the best definition uh, that I propose and that is uh, accepted by other is um, for adults, you need at least six months of evolution of uh, the symptoms to think about uh, undifferentiated systemic auto-inflammatory disease. So if you see in your consultation box one uh, patient, uh, you really need to wait uh, these six months to evoke uh, especially a monogenic auto-inflammatory disease. Of course, if you evoke uh, auto-inflammatory disease, you will have eliminated any infection and any neoplasia. And I will say you will have checked that there are almost no antibodies. Of course, I say almost no, especially if Alexander is here, because you know that in some uh, very rare auto interferonopathies or also in A20 upper insufficiency, there can be some antibodies. And almost no immune deficiency. Always, I also say almost because uh, we know that now some uh, monogenic disease uh, have immune deficiency and it's quite linked. So I say almost no, but there can be immune deficiency, for example, in actinopathies or in ADA2 deficiency. So let's see the timeline now. Uh, you have to ask yourself a question. Did it begin in childhood, even though if the patient is an adult? And how many years of evolution? Because usually it's more than six months. And then uh, you can also uh, have a patient that is addressed and has had a, a genetic uh, test before with no pathogenic mutation detect detected. And I always say now, to date, because we are in 2023 and the genetic is going very fast with a lot of progress. So uh, you have always to be checking uh, what was the, the technique, especially because some new diseases are discovered. And this is, uh, I will show you two slides now on why we have to be aware of the others because some uh, somatic mutations can be uh, discovered, especially after 50 years old. And the best example now is VEXA syndrome. So uh, maybe uh, some of you know about it. It was a very, uh, very important discovery from the NIH uh, uh, three years ago now. Uh, and they discovered uh, acquired uh, monogenic auto-inflammatory syndrome on X uh, chromosome. Um, uh, on 25 patients, firstly, and it's uh, on a gene called uh, uh, UBAR1, uh, coding for E1 enzyme of the ubiquitin pathway. And the patients have a very uh, severe inflammatory disease, usually after 50 years old, but it's not always the case. There's a very recent case at 23 years old, and it's mostly affecting men because it's on X chromosome, but in 5%, it can affect also women. So that is showing you that uh, this disease, it's a very inflammatory disease. Now uh, we have more than, for example, 300 patients in France. So all over the world, I think there are maybe 500 or maybe 1,000 patients in only three years. It means that we always have to follow the science and uh, new disease can be discovered. So 
This is why I wanted to show you again. You have to wait until at least six months and no pathogenic mutation, but you have to be aware of the technique because maybe it's an old technique and maybe you have to do another technique and maybe you have to look for new genes. So always be aware of that. So the second thing in this uh, definition is what about exception? There are some exceptions. And uh, the first exception, you all know about it, it's steel disease. Usually, we used to say adult onset steel disease, but now that we add this EULA consent, uh, we can say that it's steel disease and not adult onset steel disease, it's the same disease. So we also have to evocate it before six months in adults because it can be very, very uh, um, active and explosive. And I will speak about two other uh, diseases. One I wanted to introduce is CITRAM syndrome. We recently described about it. It's systemic inflammatory trunk recurrent acute macular eruption. I will show you pictures after. So it's a, a, a acquired uh, a sporadic disease with uh, flares with inflammatory syndrome and an eruption. I will show some picture. So uh, stay tuned because I'm sure in the next one or two years we will give you some very interesting data on the pathophysiology of this syndrome. And uh, Alexandre will be very, very happy to hear about this, but uh, it's not uh, yet uh, to be uh, said here. And of course, you may know if you are an adult, the Sneezer syndrome, which is an acquired auto-inflammatory syndrome with uh, monoclonal gammapathy. It's uh, uh, also a disease which is quite known, so I will not say a lot about it today. And uh, now, I will speak about how to explore undifferentiated systemic auto-inflammatory disease in adult patients. So this first slide, you know, it was like a geographic and uh, either you can see it uh, this way, uh, but either you can see it this way, like a spatial exploration, because it's a, a very, we are going uh, to uh, uh, unexplored ways and we really don't know uh, where to go. So how should we explore those patients? So with Marco, we chose to speak to you about three uh, different questions. Should I always perform a genetic analysis? What to do if the panel is negative? And can some undifferentiated disease be multifactorial? So the first question is, should I always perform genetic analysis in an adult? The answer is no, um, especially if the disease is totally sporadic and with a, a recent uh, apparition. And also, if you have not many clinical features and not severe, I think you should not always perform a genetic analysis. And also, I have to say, what is a genetic analysis? What are we speaking about? Is it a Sanger sequencing? Is it a panel? Is it an exome? Is it a whole genome? Of course, it depends on what is available in your country and uh, the clinic of the patient. But if it doesn't look like a monogenic disease, uh, you should not perform um, it's not mandatory to perform an, an analysis, and it's usually not very um, efficient. Uh, last uh, exploration in France showed that it's only in between 7 and 10 percent that the panel is positive for uh, patients with undifferentiated systemic auto-inflammatory disease. So I think in some cases you should do it. Marco will speak to you about the uh, very early childhood beginning, but I will say you also uh, if you have a patient with a very severe form, like with AA amyloidosis, with a lot of neuroinflammation, especially deafness and mental retardation, I really think, if, even if he's an adult, I think it's useful. And in the last cases I got, it was quite always positive in those uh, two conditions. And also, if you have a severe joint destruction, especially uh, if the uh, disease began in childhood, I think you should uh, perform a genetic test if you believe it's really an USAD. Then the second question is what to do if the panel is negative? So it means you have done a panel. And in our experience, a panel, uh, when it's negative, it's um, not always necessary to do more, um, especially if the panel is wide. But if the panel is very small, and also if the panel was um, determined a long time ago and you have new genes that were discovered, Maybe you should do more, uh, and especially if the patient is um, old, but it looks like vexas and sick, I think you should maybe do more. And we have a few experiences with whole genome sequencing in uh, undifferentiated systemic auto-inflammatory disease, where the whole genome sequencing can be positive, but it's usually 
for a very uh, early onset patients, um, always uh, with a beginning before the age of 10 years old. Then uh, I will show you some pictures of patients uh, that had finally vexas, but at first they had negative exploration because we didn't know the disease. So now we, you will only look at pictures because I think it's very interesting. Look, it's papulonodular uh, uh, lesions, and they have like an RC form, which is very specific. This is vexa syndrome. When you perform a biopsy, you see myeloid uh, progenitors and you can see uh, neutrophilic. Uh, the uh, infiltration. Here you can see some uh, erythematous papule. It can be everybody on the, everywhere on the body. And also I will show you some very specific picture around the eyes. It's called periorbital edema. It can be on one eye, it can be on the other eye. So it's a very, very specific of a VEXA syndrome. And uh, you have to uh, look for VEXA syndrome if uh, you have a patient with this and elevated CRP. Also, they have chondritis. That was in the uh, first paper. But actually, only 30% of patients display chondritis. So it's not the best uh, uh, clinical feature. The best clinical features are the ones I showed you before, the cutaneous and uh, the ocular involvement. Always uh, think about this among elderly patients, because it can also mimic a previously known uh, disease, such as lupus-like. But uh, I think lupus, when you are uh, older than 50, you, you must not evocate lupus now. You must evocate another disease, such as VESA disease. And you can see that patients can have a very uh, atypical features like ulceration also. So that's the uh, clinical uh, picture of the VEXA syndromes. But we can also have vexa like patients. We'll speak about this just after. I wanted to show you again the cutaneous lesions. They can also have pulmonary infiltration, chondritis. The eye, I told you, and they have vacuole in the progenitor and uh, usually also thrombosis. So can some undifferentiated systemic autoinflammatory is multifactorial? I think yes to date, because maybe in the future uh, we will find that everything is genetics. But right now, in 2023, we cannot say that. So uh, I, uh, I'm sure you know about steel disease. I will not speak about it today. I'm sure you all know about Schnitzler disease if you, are, uh, if you are an adult specialist, so I will not speak about this too much. I will only show you a picture of this new entity called Citrum syndrome because I'm not sure you've already seen pictures. And if you have seen 10 pictures like uh, I will show you, you will never forget about the presentation. It's always the same. They are sporadic adults. They have inflammation in crisis and they have crisis many times each year, since many years, and it's always located on the trunk. It's er erythemato papular. It's uh, like uh, this on the trunk. You can see here another, it's a lady. It's uh, going on men and women. You can see here the eruption. You can see it's erythemato papular. It's not pruriginous. Here it's another lady, always on the trunk. Another man on the trunk and on the beginning of the arm. Another, uh, it's a woman on the trunk. Another woman on the trunk. Look at the beginning of the arms also. Another lady, uh, the trunk and the beginning of the arm. So now I've shown you many pictures. I'm sure you will not uh, forget about it. It's a, a zoom on the last one. And another one here you can see on the beginning of the arm and beginning of the leg. So this is a citrum syndrome. It's a sporadic acquired multisystemic disease. And I'm sure in the future we will know more about this. So how can we classify undifferentiated systemic autoinflammatory disease? Which tool do you use to classify them? So we will speak in daily practice and research strategy. In daily practice, we always discuss genetics. But as I told you, we don't perform genetics for everybody. And now we, we mostly uh, use two tools, uh, in, at least in France, interference signature, because it's either uh, elevated or uh, not elevated. And when it's very elevated, especially of uh, more than 50, uh, we can uh, propose a JAK inhibitor. So I think it's interesting for this. Maybe you will not find the disease, but maybe you'll find the therapeutic pathway. And also, uh, thanks to all the dish concern on IL-18 and all the steel disease, we perform IL-18. Firstly, because it can show you that you are in the inflammasomopathy pathway. And also, if it's very elevated, you can evocate steel disease and perform uh, some uh, therapeutic strategy. So from a clinical point of view, sometimes you can also say, how is it close to a monogenic uh, systemic autoinflammatory disease? Is it like FMF? Is it like P53? 
BIFAPA, is it like still disease? Is it like VEXA syndrome? Now you all know about VEXA syndrome. Or if it's not, then you say it's just undifferentiated and I cannot say it looks like uh, another uh, monogenic disease. In research strategy, of course, we always discuss genetics and uh, if we have access to uh, exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing, we can discuss it, especially in a, in a multiplex uh, family or if the disease has begun very early in life. We can also perform some flow cytometry to better uh, know about the uh, lymphocytes, uh, different subtypes, also to study ASK, uh, uh, ASK um, uh, protein. And also we can perform some extensive work in a uh, research laboratory to validate, functionally validate variants, and I will not detail today. So how do we treat adults with undifferentiated systemic uh, auto-inflammatory disease? So I think I will say, just as I said before, uh, did you find it to be uh, very close to a known monogenic uh, systemic auto-inflammatory disease? If yes, you can treat them like the systemic uh, monogenic auto-inflammatory disease. So if it looks like FMF, you can try colchicin. If it looks like still disease, you can try biotherapies, especially if you have elevated IL-18, and you can try IL-1 inhibitors, and if they don't work, IL-6 inhibitors. If it looks like an interferonopathy, maybe you can find elevated uh, interferon signature and you can try JAK inhibitors. I hope you, you all recognize Jack Sparrow here. And if it looks like VEXAS, you know now we are very uh, much liking this new disease VEXAS when we are an adult, then in VEXAS, the uh, recommendation is not totally um, uh, known, but we can use IL-6 inhibitors or JAK inhibitors, or if they are very severe, we can perform a bone marrow transplant. And then if they don't look like one of those, you will say it's undifferentiated. And maybe you will try to use steroids, even though we try to use less and less steroids. Maybe you'll use one of those ones, colchicine, biotherapy, or JAK inhibitors. So be uh, caution. Uh, you can always uh, make some mistakes. So be aware that you always have to ask yourself, is it really an undifferentiated systemic inflammatory disease? Uh, isn't it an inflammatory bowel disease or a pneumopathy, a neoplasia, or a Castleman syndrome? So we always have to keep that in mind. And we always have to uh, follow up our patients, especially, I will say, because I'm an adult, for kidney evolution uh, in order uh, to prevent AA amyloidosis. So now I'm finished, and I hope Marco Gattorno arrived, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. Uh, really fantastic talk and breaking news. Uh, five minutes <laughs> ago, Ad, uh, Marco was just left. Um, maybe oh, to, to till here. To let, uh, I don't see him uh, in the anymore? in the participants. I, I will. Uh, I will I, try start with uh, some words of introduction about Marco that really doesn't need it, but. Uh, maybe we can have a few seconds to let him get in again, uh, if you agree, Alexander. Uh, so Marco, uh, as I said, doesn't really need an introduction. Uh, he is one of the greatest international uh, experts in uh, auto-inflammatory disorder, um, whose work really contributes to uh, several milestones in, in the field. He is actually the chief of the Pediatric Rheumatology Unit and the Center of Auto-Inflammatory Disease in uh, the Gaslina uh, Institute in Genoa, Italy. And he coordinates the uh, largest uh, uh, international registry for auto-inflammatory disorders, which is Eurofever. Um, so uh, we will would be really pleased to have his uh, have he with us today to give his uh, perspective on uh, uh, undifferentiated uh, uh, systemic auto-inflammatory disease, which really are, I think, one of the most complex uh, uh, clinical challenge, uh, actually. Um, I don't know if we have any... Uh, News from him. Marco. I see Marco on the on the phone. So I suspect Marco, you are calling with the your own phone because the, the the computer was not connected. Correct? 
Hello, Good. can you hear me? Yes, you, yes, we can hear you clearly. Bravi, very good. I'm very <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it uh, was, a, was a disaster. I have to say my fault <laughs> that I didn't uh, uh, test. Uh, I was able to, to follow a little bit the, the presentation of Sophie. Um, I, if I sent the, 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 the slides to, to Colleen, maybe I don't know if she's able to, to show the slides. I've got, unfortunately, I, I did so. not receive the slides in my emails. Um, I've uh, been looking. I'm sorry. Oh my God. I don't have them. Oh, so it's a pity because uh, I've uh, I I sent some 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 minutes ago. Now ten minutes ago. It's so strange that uh, that no, they no, didn't arrive okay. right yet. Can you I send it to uh, me? Um, because yes. Maybe let me try Sophie instead. Yes. Because I could share my screen, so maybe I could. Ah yes. Uh, oh my God. So I try to to send to to Sophie. I'm very sorry, but um, also because the time is running, and uh, maybe if you want to to start, I can hear you. If you want to start a a discussion, and if I if I if I'm able to to send to to yeah. Sophie. Yeah. Uh, you yeah, can or start maybe, Marco, uh, yes. while we are waiting for your slide, because we had the same plan, you know, yes. same uh, red line, maybe you can yes. uh, speak. Uh, I'm not sure you need slides if you follow the, the red line. No, yeah, I can, I can try to follow just a discussion. <laughs> uh, and then uh, in, in the middle, why I'll try to, to send the mail to the, the, the Apple to you. Uh, I, I, I start following the... the the, the, the fourth question that uh, you uh, you already uh, uh, show I, I guess uh, Sophie uh, that uh, we agree uh, uh, on that were uh, what is autoinflammatory disease uh, for uh, an undefined autoinflammatory disease for us that is the first point uh, for uh, the perspective of a pediatrician uh, and uh, I, I think that there is quite similar our patient that uh, have a clear signs of autoinflammatory disease uh, after the exclusion of inflammatory other inflammatory conditions such as rheumatic disease inflammatory bowel disease or uh, mimic condition such as hematological disease tumors and uh, immunodeficiencies or also if you can uh, exclude some uh, multifactorial, monogenic, and multifactorial autoinflammatory disease. So patients that have the clear phenotype of uh, an autoinflammatory disease in which we are not able to identify uh, a, a, a specific gene or even a multifactorial uh, autoinflammatory disease. This is uh, the definition that I think is quite similar to, to the definition provided by Sophie. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Maybe, Sophie, if uh, in the meanwhile uh, the, the slides arrive, uh, you can uh, put... A, I still a, don't have them, but maybe it's too heavy. I don't know. Ah, maybe. Uh, let's see. Um, then, uh, um, in... Uh, yes, recapito fallito. Too heavy. My God, it's a disaster. <laughs> However, uh, <laughs> what I can say just for the discussion, just to make very quick and then to have a discussion, that, of course, uh, for the pediatric uh, perspective, uh, uh, the genetic analysis is rather important, and I think that the patient that uh, have uh, a clear phenotype of uh, an autoinflammatory disease has to be uh, uh, extensively, extensively uh, um, uh, look for a possible uh, gene mutation. Uh, maybe that could be different from the adult. Of course, uh, we have to take into consideration that uh, uh, we can have also some autoinflammatory, multifactorial autoinflammatory diseases, uh, even in, uh, in pediatric age, but especially in a patient that have a, has a very early onset uh, uh, inflammatory disease uh, uh, that smell of uh, autoinflammation, I think that genetic analysis seems have to be performed in a quite extensive way. Uh, as, as you know, of course, we have the panels, and that is quite important because through the panels uh, and NGS, we can build up panels. Uh, NGS is very important because uh, help us to, to uh, identify if we 
ask to our geneticist uh, possible uh, mosaicism, and that is quite important because sometimes we define a patient have uh, uh, possible caps, uh, and uh, we have to be sure that we do not miss uh, a, a mosaicism. And this is quite important because uh, sometimes this is not a, a undefined autoinflammatory disease, but it's simply because we are not able to identify the patient uh, in a proper genetic way. Uh, of course, now the number of genes that uh, uh, now are pertinent to autoinflammatory disease is increasing a lot. You know very well that in the last, uh, uh, in the last uh, um, communication of the human inborn errors, uh, the field of autoinflammatory disease uh, were those that, uh, that, that increase uh, uh, a lot, more than 25% of new diseases. This is the, the field that is increasing more in the field of old in, inborn error. And this makes a lot very difficult to evaluate our undefined patient because new diseases are coming. And in a fantastic slide that, that I had, I'm sorry, uh, the, I outlined the problem that we have now uh, is the continuous re-evaluation of our patient with undefined autoinflammatory disease. So we have to check periodically if the patient that uh, we have already uh, uh, described and studies maybe can fit with a new diseases. So uh, the approach in a patient with an autoinflammatory disease, a pediatric patient with autoinflammatory disease, is to go for sure from the panels to the wall exome sequencing. This is the, the only way to do. Uh, uh, all the patients that have a suspect of uh, uh, an autoinflammatory disease, a pediatric patient, in my opinion, have to go to the wall exome sequencing. And that is quite important because uh, you can make then in silico panels, that is the important thing, but also to explore the exome maybe also in genes that are not properly in the context of the classical autoinflammatory disease, but of condition that are out of the field of autoinflammatory disease, but has a prevalent and very important inflammatory manifestation. So that's why it's so important not to stick to the panels, but go to wall exome sequencing. And most importantly, because if you do a wall, wall exome sequencing in your patient, you can come back to your patient and to reanalyze uh, for new diseases. And that is the system that we have the Gazzini Institute try to make this circular, circular evaluation. Of course, some condition can be uh, uh, undefined, uh, autoinflammatory disease that are not genetic. In, uh, I don't know what, I, I, I miss what uh, Sophie told about the, the multifactorial autoinflammatory disease. For sure, not all the patients that uh, we see with a clear sign of autoinflammatory disease are monogenic. Some of them are for sure multifactorial. Uh, the, the example in, in, pediatri in, in, in the pediatric uh, um, age is for sure PFAPA that uh, we see a lot. I know Sophie is not very, very happy with the, the, the PFAPA in adults. Um, but we have, have also this patient with SURF that indeed seems to be of course, we have to screen this patient with SURF for possible gene, other genes, but uh, it's highly possible that there, is other there are other conditions, like SURF, in my, in my opinion, that can be more multifactorial. They are quite homogeneous because they have abdominal pain, they, ha they have an FMF-like phenotype, and they respond quite well to colchicine. Maybe some of them can be a, a monogenic disease, but it's highly possible that uh, a part of them can be part of a multifactorial disease. And I want to finish my, my small uh, short intervention on the possible tools. I'm sure Sophie have already uh, uh, say something about cytokine and so on. I think that uh, when we have a patient in front of us, uh, we have some tools that can be quite useful. For example, what we use uh, is uh, the use of uh, cytokine levels. There are now some, uh, some uh, um, uh, machinery like ELLA, for example, that is able to, to provide the evidence 
on uh, different cytokines uh, in the same uh, moment. And uh, you can um, build up some panels of cytokines, for example, uh, a mass panel with uh, uh, interferon gamma 6, CL10, IL10, or you, you can make an inflammatory panel in which you can measure IL-10, I-1 receptor antagonist, IL-6. It's much better I-1 receptor antagonist than IL-6 because IL-1 itself, because IL-1, as you know, is uh, poorly detected in the CIRA. IL-1 receptor antagonist is very good in, uh, in making a, 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 a surrogate marker of IL-1 activity. So cytokines some, sometimes can orientate in this out, undefined autoinflammatory disease also, cytofluorimetric analysis is quite important. Uh, we have a lot of patients that we define as um, uh, undefined autoinflammatory disease that uh, have a, uh, maybe lymphoproliferation and some cytopenia. And the use of, for example, double negative T cells has been quite important to, to show the presence of, uh, of an ABS-like phenotype and to orientate the patient towards the a genetic analysis, but also towards the treatment, because they respond quite well to mycophenolate and sirolimus. Um, uh, there is also a, a very potent cytofluorimetric analysis, as you know, that is on the level of uh, CD8, uh, CD3, CD8, uh, um, CD38, 38 um, um, uh, T cells that are quite specific uh, to, uh, to, to differentiate uh, HLH and uh, uh, mass uh, from sepsis. This is a quite specific uh, um, cytofluorimetric that can orientate you in a patient that have a, a mass-like phenotype. Even if the genetic analysis is negative, you are able to identify them with this very important cytofluorimetric analysis. Um, and finally, the functional test. There are some functional tests that can orientate you a lot. The ADA2 enzymatic activity is very important because uh, uh, you can orientate also in strange phenotypes for ADA2. If you have the enzymatic test in-house or you can send it, sometimes you can find some surprises in undifferentiated autoinflammatory disease for ADA2. And also sometimes, you know that ADA2 sometimes is difficult to, to to identify for genetic analysis because is uh, in a region that uh, is subjected to a number of copy number variation and uh, sometimes it's difficult to, to identify the, the deletion or duplication and if you have a clinical phenotype and other two activity that is zero you have to push a lot with geneticists to go on uh, with the, the analysis of deletion or or uh, or or duplication. And the interferon signature for sure is another important aspect that can help you to identify your patient, the undifferentiated autoinflammatory patient as a possible uh, interferonopathy. And this is, of course, is quite important when you talk with the geneticist. Uh, I have the feeling from the clinical point of view and also for the interferon signature that the gene that could be involved in this uh, child could be related to, of course, the interferon pathway. This uh, uh, um, um, continuous uh, um, evaluation of the clinical phenotype, the functional tests, such interferonopathies, is also important not only to classify these uh, uh, undefined uh, uh, autoinflammatory disease, but also to talk with the geneticist uh, to try to help them to identify a possible gene. I finish with the last point that was pointed out by the questions, how to treat. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry because I, I spent some several, uh, one hour to build up a new, a new slides that I like very much. And uh, in which I, I show you that uh, according to the clinical picture and some laboratory examination, uh, uh, what I tried to do uh, in recurrent fever if you have a recurrent fever, I usually start with colchicin and maybe afterwards with I1 inhibition. If I have a patient with systemic inflammation, rash, and evident inflammation with neutrophilia, I1 inhibition seems to be in a, in a systemic-like disease, 
the best choice. My, maybe sometimes uh, also anti IL-6, if IL-6 is very elevated. Um, in cases in, in, in which you have lymphoproliferation, plus or minus cytopenia, some cytopenia, and maybe you have double negative cells, of course, mycophenolate sirolimus sometimes are the best choice and the first choice in this kind of uh, undefined autoinflammatory disease. If you have a patient, for kind of patient with autoimmune-like manifestation and interferon signature positive, of course, this is very smelling of an interferonopathies or an autoimmune interferonopathies. And so immunosuppressants and JAK inhibitors can be the, the drug of choice. Uh, if there are smell of renopathies, uh, the, the, the people from, uh, from NIH is uh, setting up uh, that is, I, quite, I think it's quite interesting, a sort of NF-kappa-B uh, signature. That will be very important to uh, use in comparison with interferon signature in those patients that have a suspect of uh, relopathies uh, through the NF-kappa-B. That will be quite interesting. So if you have a patient of, uh, with paniculitis, a bitchet-like disease, and or pan like disease, maybe anti-TNF treatment can be uh, the most important one. So I'm very sorry. Uh, I was very boring. I don't know if you <laughs> if you uh, have understood anything about my my uh, discussion, uh, uh, but I think that I will stop here, and maybe we can have uh, 15 minutes for for uh, the debate. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. It was an incredible uh, challenge to speak without any slides. So congratulations. I imagine how difficult it was, and you made this very well. And uh, oh, all you. the attendees were still looking at you on your phone, so definitely <laughs> well done. I'm very sorry. I'm very deeply sorry for, to, for everybody. It was very boring. I'm, <laughs> I'm very sorry. But uh, now I would like to, to talk a little bit with Sophie you know, and with you. I, I imagine maybe the, the picture that you have on all these different situations that we can treat, we can share this with the audience. I don't know if, Colleen, we have the emails, but as you made a, a, a lot of time on this picture, or slide, yeah, yeah. we can maybe share it send. this time, or I'm sure we'll listen to you all the time. Oh, yes, maybe, Marco, but, also yes. during so the you discussion, can ask, you can upload on WeTransfer during the discussion. Yeah. Maybe yeah. in five minutes, uh, Colleen will get it and we can watch together, discover this <laughs> oh, incredible right, uh, Yes, I will do that. Picture. Yes, but in the meanwhile, if we want to, 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 to talk, to, to have a discussion all together, it would be also, also nice. I don't know. I don't know if there are questions or, or points that we have to touch, <clears throat> uh, we want to touch uh, all together. So, uh, Alex, uh, I don't know if uh, in the meanwhile uh, the um, attendants can uh, write their question on uh, on the chat, and we will uh, of course uh, give priority to them. Waiting for them, uh, um, I have a, a question for uh, for both of you. Uh, I'm really curious to see how different can be the the approach from uh, the pediatric and uh, adult perspective so the, this condition of uh, undifferentiated uh, systemic uh, inflammatory disorders are really complex and what a i think the challenge in in clinical practice is to know uh, when uh, we feel uh, enough confident to start an empiric treatment, like uh, in in, and I would like to know if uh, which is your 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 perspective. So when you feel that the differential diagnosis is almost complete, and to start a treatment for a patient. So why okay. Marco seems to be very concentrated on his computer, I will answer. So um, go 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 go. go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Younger. so um, firstly, the most important, if the patient is severe, from a clinical point of view, also as an adult, you can see the severity from clinical feature, fever, hypertension, uh, weight loss, etc. But also if the CRP is constantly elevated, when it never gets down, that's the case in VEXAS syndrome, for example, uh, when it's never low, 
um, we are more confident, firstly, to perform genetic analysis. I will not say we'll do it every time, but we are more confident. And also to uh, uh, begin a treatment. Um, and I will say some of our treatments are, don't have so many complications. I will say, for example, IL-1 inhibitors that don't have so many like infectious complications. So uh, we can try them. Uh, uh, for example, if we suspect a steel disease, very acute. Um, and um, <clears throat> so IL-1 inhibitors, I think we are uh, quite confident to, to begin them when it's like a, a storm and we have to, 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 to stop the storm. Um, also steroids. And I think sometimes we can also try when it's a big storm, like a, a lung disease storm, we can also discuss about jack inhibitors. But for the other ones, we always have a few days to wait. That's maybe what I can say. Uh, if you answer like what we would do in an emergency or in kind of uh, um, uh, urgent cases, that's what we would say. Maybe now Marco wants to answer. No, yes, I think that is always tricky. Uh, starting a treatment uh, when you do not do not have a, a specific, um, let's say, diagnosis. Uh, even if uh, because the differential diagnosis we know very well is so difficult, uh, either both in children and in adults, uh, there are plenty of difficult uh, condition uh, like tumors, lymphomas, and so on that we have all, always to think about uh, that can have a very strange presentation and then sometimes can be very tricky, uh, the differentiation. Uh, of course, uh, um, if you have, uh, I try to to select some uh, specific treatment for the different condition that maybe try to prevent the use of steroid at, um, as much as possible um, <clears throat> when you do not have a proper uh, identification. Uh, sometimes it's not easy, especially if the conditions are very, very severe, uh, like a systemic like, or of course, if you have a mass like phenotype in which you have to, be, to, to use a steroid, even if you don't have the, 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 the exact diagnosis. Um, and so sometimes using cold kissing for a current fever, using I1 inhibitors that uh, help us also to, to maybe keep on with the, the workup for the differential diagnosis in the patient, uh, sometimes they can help a lot. And uh, I, I underline uh, how sometimes uh, mycophenolate and sirolimus help us in this kind of condition in which you have a lot of lymphoproliferation and uh, some, some kind of uh, cytopenia. And this is something also preventing the use of steroids, something that sometimes helps a lot uh, in, uh, in such uh, patients. Yeah, we have a question uh, on that specific issue on the chat. So it comes from Elizabeth Ang. Could you please speak a bit more on clinical phenotype or pattern that would benefit from the treatment of MMF or CMUS uh, independently of the, 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 the T-cell phenotype? And on the top yeah. of that, I would just ask you if you, in the population, could think about abatacept, for example. Uh, yes, yeah, so we we uh, yes, that's that's that could be another another possibility, uh, especially if the smell if of LRBA or CTLL4, in which abatacept can be really uh, useful. Uh, we, usually, we we tend to to try in this undifferentiated with uh, lymphoproliferation, and uh, sometimes they do not have a clear cytopenia, but uh, sometimes they have. Uh, low reduction of platelets uh, and uh, um, maybe uh, the the white blood cells are not that high. Sometimes I'm rather rather low. This is uh, something that smell of a, an Alps-like phenotype, let's say. And even if maybe the double negative are not that uh, that uh, uh, that high. Uh, and um, in those patients, uh, we have the 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 experience that anti L1 inhibition doesn't work at all and is a cold kissing and uh, um, these drugs mycophenolate and sirolimus are are more useful uh, sometimes in some condition wrapped like uh, rip uh, uh, one kinase uh, you know that maybe also anti l6 in some of these condition can help also of course it's very 
is very is very is quite difficult to 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 uh, uh, to find out uh, the, the the good drug uh, for uh, each patient because uh, every patient is special. But generally speaking, the 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 use of mycophenolated sirolimus are in this context. See um, any additional question in the chat? So um, can ask an, another one on Citram syndrome. Um, have you seen this, Marco, in pediatric practice? This Citram syndrome with this strong uh, rash, very weird. And uh, for you, Sophie, how do you explain this lo specific location? Is that related to the mastocyte distribution in the body, or is there any reason? Uh we don't um, we don't believe it's mast cell linked, uh, especially on uh, skin biopsy. All of them at skin biopsy, and there's no mast cell infiltration. Uh, there's no specific uh, histology. So um, for us, it's like inflammatory uh, mechanism. It's only for two three days after big asthenia, uh, and then fever, and then the rash, and the, the topography, we don't know why, but it's the trunk and the, the really the beginning of the arms here, and also sometime on the beginning of the of the leg, uh, and it's very specific. Uh, when you sh when you show the picture to a patient with a citram, he say, "Oh, it's me." Uh, mm. uh, on the on the publication, one patient told me. I told you not to publish my picture. I said it. It was not you. <laughs> <laughs> she thought it was her. <laughs> so I had to prove her it was not her. I said, "Oh yeah, the, my underwear was not the same." Okay, so hmm. so they are the same, and it's and I got we got some uh, after the publi first publication we got some emails from many patients uh, all over the world that found our emails and they found the picture maybe on Twitter or whatever, and also from doctors. They are doctors, but they have Citram syndrome, and they tell us nobody could tell us what it was. So um, I think it's interesting because it's very clinical, and uh, maybe uh, if we have some adult participants, they, maybe they have seen one or they will see one. So that's why I wanted you to show many pictures because if you have seen them, you cannot forget it. And maybe you, the pediatrician, you will see them, but in maybe elderly children, like yeah, yeah. in years old, yeah. <laughs> elderly exactly. children. No, no. Yeah, it's very interesting, very interesting. And I never seen a patient, I mean, now I have to recall, because now when you see new things, you have to come back to, with <laughs> with the patient that you have seen. That is very interesting. I don't know, I don't know. For I don't have the memory of such a patient. I don't know, Alex, do you have a, some pediatric patient? That, oh, never seen. Look at Vexas yeah. syndrome. The, the no, no, youngest it's very, very Vexas, interesting. Yes, yes, absolutely. The Vexas one? He's 23 years old now, so I'm sure ah. you, the pediatrician, you will find uh, uh, UBA1 mutated patients in the sooner future. or later. Yes, sooner or later. Sooner yes, or later. We, we will, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure too. Yes, it's quite it's so interesting. Also, this overlap with the pediatric and adult presentation. We, I think we, we have a last have... philosopher question. Yes. Francesca, please uh, read the question. <laughs> So the, the question is from uh, Jose Hernandez. Uh, he asked, uh, especially to, to Sophie, um, why she <laughs> seems not to like so much the concept of PFAS syndrome in adults, <laughs> as uh, uh, he thinks that um, we uh, all see this type of patients with this uh, syndrome. Uh, as a syndrome, uh, 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 it can be still called the PFAPA, uh, of course, until we uh, find a possible cause. So since adults have not been studied extensively in this sense yet, so what do you so, both think about uh, PFAPA? So I say hello to my friend from, uh, from uh, Spain. Hey. And uh, so it's kind of provocative to say that I don't believe in PFAPA, but I think we have to be provocative to improve. Because PFAPA, it's a very specific definition with a lot of orally located features, like the uh, um, buccal ulcer, the adenopathy, the uh, fever. But we have patients that could be PFAPA, but they also have abdominal pain and arthralgia. So they are atypical PFAPA. And when you are atypical PFAPA, you are undifferentiated systemic auto-inflammatory disease. So I think it's better to speak with the right words. 
because uh, then you tell them you have PFAPA and they say, yes, but when I go on internet, PFAPA, you, uh, you don't have the disease after, uh, when you're adult, you don't have any more the disease. So I should have uh, uh, no more symptoms. So I'm not really PFAPA. And also because in PFAPA, Colchicin doesn't work all the time. And also because we don't want to give steroids all their lives to people that are called PFAPA. So for all those reasons, I think it's a name problem. I think it's just like a taxonomy uh, question. And I think we should use this new term, which is more appropriate, undifferentiated systemic auto-inflammatory disease. I think it's more appropriate. And inside, we have some PFAPA-like patients, maybe. Uh, and when I get some uh, children from pediatry with previously said PFAPA, I said, so you were called PFAPA, but you are an adult, you still have features, so maybe you are not totally a PFAPA. And I, on the uh, consultation uh, conclusion, I say, it's maybe more undifferentiated systemic auto-inflammatory disease, and I always ask, should I perform genetic analysis? So I will stop to speak. Mm. Now, may maybe if I can say something on that, uh, I believe in PFAPA in pediatrics because we see a yes, lot. But, no, but I think that uh, I also believe, start to believe quite a lot to the terms of SURF. And that SURF can be really a, 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 distinct, uh, um, a distinct entity uh, that defining children for sure patients that have uh, not a PFAPA phenotype because they do not have tonsils and so on. They have abdominal pain, arthralgia, and they respond very well to colchicine. Uh, and I think that the term SURF is quite uh, is nice and also can help us uh, also to identify maybe some adult patient that uh, has more uh, this uh, non-ETN-like uh, phenotype uh, that respond to colchicine. And it will be interesting to see indeed if uh, some of your patients with recurrent fever can be more fitting with a SURF. Uh, I think that that is a very good, nice, is a nice uh, field of exp of, uh, of study in the next years uh, to define better uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, condition of uh, un uh, uh, not genetic uh, recurrent fever that uh, in the past we put uh, in a basket as a pediatrician in the same basket of the PFAPA. Now we understand that, that uh, the situation is a little bit dif different. It is a little bit more um, differentiated, in my opinion. I really like this answer. <laughs> I hope uh, Rosé also liked it. Okay. I'm sure he liked it. So I think Bravo, Jose. Yeah, I totally Bravo, agree. Jose. I see. <laughs> we we are we have almost done. So I think uh, we we need now to to congratulate uh, to all the two speakers and. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this fantastic uh, talk. So it could be seen uh, after uh, for those who didn't participate. In. So thank you, Francesca, for being there and all the attendees. So see you thank in you. a month for a new Tuesday lunch with Rita. And thank you all. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry thank you, again. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Ciao, Sophie. Congratulations. Thank you.